four. I have no idea what that was. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dulce America. My name is Bing Futch. Thank you very much for joining me. Happy New Year again. I figured since we ended last year on such an extremely intense note with uh, that six-week study on chord building, that we would, first of all, start off on a much lighter tangent, and second of all, continue doing a series of episodes that string together certain concepts that hopefully you can use during the new year in your practice with the mountain dulcimer. So starting today, we're gonna to have a four week series on elements of song. We're gonna take one particular song, in this case, what I just played, Black Mountain Rag, which is a great old time tune. And we're gonna go part by part and take a look at these basic elements of just about every tune that we play. Starting off with melody, moving on to harmony, going into chords, and then adding bass to it. So this way you'll be able to understand how these parts work together and when you play these tunes uh, with your friends or with your dulcimer groups or wherever else you might perform, you can take these different parts and all of you can combine these different elements and have a lot of fun making your own arrangements. So that's for like your beginner to intermediate players perhaps that will look at this sort of thing. And then on the other side of it, we're gonna take a look at how you can come up with your own elements of song for each one of these instances and I'll explain kind of the theory behind that. So hopefully there'll be a, something a little bit for everybody during this four week series. So today of course we'll work on melody and before we get down deep into the first aspect of a song, I wanna to talk to and shout out to one of my patrons on Patreon, Jane Hill. Jane, thank you so much for becoming a patron and I just appreciate the fact that all of you guys are very engaging on the Patreon site. And what I really love the most about it is it isn't just me offering up all my old stuff, it's me getting ideas from you about what you'd like to learn, and that's where these series have come from. So I really appreciate uh, your every day being there for me so I can sit back and chill out and do the research and come up with new content that'll help you on your journey, not only with Mountain Dulcimer, but with Native American flute, music theory, ukulele, and, uh, and songwriting. Whatever you'd like to learn, I'm happy to somehow make that happen for you. So I thank you, Jane, for being a patron, and I thank all of my other patrons who are there every single day, becoming a part of my art, and one of the biggest things right now is the fact that I'm mixing this album I've been working on for five years, The Beauty and the Terror. And, uh, you know, life is a little weird right now, and all my gigs last year were canceled, looking like this year might be about the same way until things iron themselves out a bit. Uh, but I can continue to just focus on mixing. There's no money in mixing. You don't make an income from mixing an album. But I don't have to worry about it. I can take my time to make sure it sounds the best it possibly can because of the support of my patrons. So, Jane, thank you very much. And to all my patrons, I love you guys so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, if you're interested in checking out this Patreon thing, there's a link down here, patreon.com slash bingfutch. Scroll past all of the sign-up stuff. Don't even worry about that yet. Go down to the little featured tag section. Click on the one that says Open House, and that's going to open up over 500 different free posts. You don't have to be a member. All you have to do is click on it to download free music. Music, videos, tablature, book selections, all kinds of stuff. Try before you buy, shop a little bit around, and then if you like what you hear and see, it's just $5 a month to get unlimited access to all of that material, plus new exclusive weekly content. Plus you can also subscribe for a year, become an annual pass holder, get 16% off, which is two months free, and you also get additional discounts with the cool little annual pass holder magnet. 
that I send out to all annual pass holders. So again, check out patreon.com slash bingfutch. Take a look around and see if you might become a patron just like Jane Hill. Again, Jane, thank you mm, very, very much. All right, so let's take a look at the first element in our Elements of Song, and that's going to be melody. When you think about a tune, you think about something that people can hum as they're walking down the street. And generally speaking, people don't always hum the harmony. They don't really hum chords. You can't, unless maybe you're a two-band uh, throat singer. And they don't normally hum bass lines unless it's a really super cool bass line, like bum, bum, bum. Ba bum 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 ba bum. Know what I'm saying? But typically we hum the melody of a tune. It's what typically is matched together with lyrics that you can sing, or it's the melody that stands out above everything else. Melody is the king of every single piece of music that we write. And the melody can be very, very simple, or the melody can be really intricate and sort of crazy and off kilter. But no matter what, it's probably the number one thing that people think about when they enjoy a piece of music. So let's first of all take a look at Black Mountain Rag. And uh, what I'm going to do is walk you through these different elements for every single week, and then we'll put them all together at the end with some looping. But right now, you've heard me play through the tune one time. Let me just go ahead and show you the melody for Black Mountain Rag. On just the melody string, I might go over to the middle string a little bit. And I'll show you how that works in case you're not familiar with the tune. If you're familiar with the tune, just kind of hang tight or maybe fast forward until you see me stop doing this overhead camera view. So we are in the key of D. I'm using DAD tuning here. And our first note is going to be at the second fret. That's F sharp. So here's how the melody of Black Mountain Rag goes. I'll try and just use one finger here so you can follow along where I'm going. Then we're just going to repeat that. And that is the A part of the tune. And this song is broken down into three different sections, A, B, and C. That's the A part. Now we're gonna move on to the B part. So we're gonna start here again. Coming across on the middle string to catch uh, the B note right there. And then we'll repeat that. And that's the B part, very, very simple. One thing to remember with a lot of different old time tunes is that uh, different regions of the country will play it maybe just a little bit differently and maybe start with a different part than other people start with. Many people start with the A part here, some people start with the C part, and some little bits of melody, there may be an extra note in there or maybe fewer notes. Don't worry about it, as long as you're somewhere in the general ballpark, you should be okay. So there's our B part. Now we're going to go to the C part. The C part is twice as long as the A and B part. So we're going to do this coming from the second fret again. And that is the C part to Black Mountain Rag. So we've got our A section, our B section, and our C section there. And then we repeat the entire tune over again, as many times as you like, until somebody sticks their foot out or yells foot, and then the song is done. 
So let me go ahead and play through that A part, B part, and C part again. I'm gonna use multiple fingers this time just to show you another different way you can do it. You can play Noter style with one finger, but I also like using multiple fingers because you can hold down those notes a bit longer and get them more fluid, legato. The notes are actually touching each other. We're slurring them together as opposed to making them kind of staccato and separated. And it makes for a nice smooth flowing melody. What I really like about Black Mountain Rag is it's a nice, simple little melody. It doesn't do anything really, really tricky at the beginning. And then as it lures you deeper into the song, it's got a few more little twists and turns that it does. If you think about a song as a ride, and those of you who know me and know I love theme parks, the allegory is not that far-fetched. When you get on the ride, everything is chill. You're in the station. You haven't started screaming yet. Everything's cool. Then you go up that lift, you know, or it starts moving and you're like, oh, hey, what's going on? Where, what's going to happen next? And then things start to happen and you go, oh, that was fun. Oh, oh, that was fun. And then it kind of maybe chills out a bit and you're like, oh, is it over? Oh my gosh, here it comes, here comes some more. And so you've got a combination of a couple of things going. You've got tension and release. You build up to something and then it kind of relaxes and then it builds up some more and it relaxes. Maybe even you can compare this to a rubber band. When the song begins, the rubber band is slack. And when the song continues on and begins to move and do things, we stretch that rubber band, we create some tension, and then we relax that rubber band. So we've got lots of peaks and valleys instead of just kind of staying the same all the way through. So it's a really interesting thing to look at with a simple tune like Black Mountain Rag, but you can definitely get a lot more complex. A couple of things I want to point out about Black Mountain Rag is there is a symmetrical nature to a lot of the melodies that we play. Those melodies will start off the same way, but they these phrases, these melodic phrases will end differently. For example, take a listen to the A part again. Okay, we go... Okay. So that's very, very simple, and we're ending on an A right there. But the second part of the A part changes the last part of that. The first part of it's the same. But this time, we're going to go... So there's a sym sym symmetry going on there. The first part of each of those little melodic phrases is the same. One sets up the other. If this was dialogue, we could call this the question. And we could probably call that the answer. If this leaves you hanging for more, yeah, what happened next? Oh, that's what happened next. Okay, let's get deeper into the story. Tell me more. You don't say. So in this case, we're just going to repeat that. Someone might say at that point, that you don't say. 
Well, yes, as a matter of fact. Well, yes, yes. After you say it a second time, I do see that that's exactly what you were saying. So you don't always have to make it different. But what I really like about this is we started off with a sort of question and answer. And then we came into a, a declarative statement, a declaration. We said something twice. You know, sometimes you want to make sure that everything is clear as possible. So you say it twice. That's very misleading because the next section, as we found out already, is twice as long and it's a little loopy and it does a lot of stuff. So that plateau of just repeating a melodic phrase twice is a very is a very simple way of releasing the tension. Now we build that tension up in a longer melodic phrase, or if you will, a longer melodic sentence. And by the way, we start this off sounding like the declarative melody that we just said twice. So it almost sounds like we're gonna say it again, but this time we actually elaborate. So let me just go back to the B section for a second. You don't say. Well, yes, as a matter of fact. Well, isn't that something? I had no idea. Yeah, and you know what? But then, we've got a lot more to say about this situation. That right there has got a little bit of tension. That leaves you hanging. Well, what else are you trying to tell me? Sounds a bit like what you were just saying, but it ends differently. Well, wow, that's quite the finish. And you'll notice how those notes begin to walk down until we get back to our open note, D, on the melody string. And that brings us back home and enables us to take the whole thing around again. So it is not to say that melodies that travel upwards are always questions and melodies that travel downward are often answers. But we do think in terms of how far from the root or the uh, note that we began with, how far from that root are we getting? Then the further away we get, I think the deeper we get into the sentences that we speak. And when we want to bring things back home again, full circle round, we'll come back down in pitch. So ideas of pitch, meaning how high or high, how low a note is, are things to consider when working with melodies. Also, how long a melody phrase might be, or a melodic phrase might be. It can be just a few notes. Or it could be a much longer sentence, a musical sentence. That's almost a run-on sentence, but that's okay in the terms of music. We won't start diagramming sentences like we did in English class, right? So we're going to be looking at this Black Mountain Rag melody over the next four weeks and incorporating some of the other elements into it. But I did want to show it to you in case you didn't know the tune and also talk a little bit about how maybe the songwriter uh, was considering putting this stuff together. And that's where right now we're going to shift from some, some of the beginning intermediate and maybe now get into an advanced intermediate advanced place. But everybody, of course, should try this out uh, in putting your own songs together and getting some of the theory behind um, these different elements of song. So first of all, the melody. The melody can be seen as just coming out of the seven notes of whatever key that we're in, the scale 
that represents that particular key. Since we're in the key of D, we're talking about the D major scale, and every single one of those melody notes is coming out of the D major scale. We don't use all of the notes. We're really kind of using, we're using F sharp a lot, we're using A, we're using B, we're using E, you know, we're not using C sharp, we are using D, so I mean, and we're using G. So we are actually using six of the seven notes of the D major scale. And it's a wonderful tune, it's very easy to sing. And if we wanted to, we could make things fancy by going outside of the scale and picking some notes that are not part of it. But for most of the songs that you want to start writing, you can do it all within the scale. And that's called playing in a diatonic fashion. Diatonic is a big fancy word, which basically just relates to the seven notes of the scale and the seven chords that we can build off of those seven notes. And you can just stick within the key, whatever you're doing, and make some really interesting music. So when you're starting to write your own piece of music, the first thing you want to really get inside your head is what are the notes, what are the seven notes of the diatonic scale or the key that I'm in? And of course we've got D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, and then that's, those are the seven notes right there. Now, of course, the top of the scale is the octave D, which is an octave higher in pitch than our tonic or root note where we began the scale. So as you're writing a piece of music, and thankfully with the mountain dulcimer, we don't necessarily have to start thinking about chords right away. One of the beautiful things about this instrument is that you can just play the seven notes of the scale in any combination you like, and allow the bass string and the middle string to just drone on like the drone of a bagpipe. And it will be perfectly in tune with what you're doing. So as you saw before, when I was playing the melody, I was playing some harmony and doing some chords and stuff like that. But if I don't do that, it still sounds really cool. So you don't have to think about anything other than just the melody. And that's a great way to start things off in writing your first tune. So number one thing is know what your scale is and know where those notes are located. Not just on the melody string, but on the middle string and on the bass string as well. Notice at one point in time, instead of coming up here to B, I actually go down here to B because that is where all of my my activity is focused at that moment in time, and I don't want to run all the way up here, and so I come down here instead. Also, this B up here is an octave higher than the B down here, and that one fits a lot better as well. And so you'll make decisions like that as well. As far as your phrases, just kind of play around with them. Any note, any of the notes in the D major scale are going to be perfect for your melody. It's a good idea to start with the root or the first note of the scale as the first note of your melody. That's going to be D. Now, notice that we didn't do that with Black Mountain Rag. We actually started with the third note of the scale, F sharp, and that's fine too. In fact, and we'll get deeper into this when we get into our third week, any note in the D major chord is going to work whether it be D, F sharp, or A, the fifth note of the scale. So we could start our melody on A, for example,
ta-da, you know, stuff like that. So you don't have to start with D, but it's a great idea because if you start with D and you think about trying to end your melody eventually, not in every phrase, but eventually end your melody on D, it's just sort of a nice pair of bookends for the melody that you write. And these can be very, very short phrases, you know, four beats or four measures or eight measures. Maybe your whole song is only eight bars or 16 bars. Or it could be a lot more than that. So I would start off with choosing melodies that are like bite-sized fragments, just little phrases to work with, you know. Uh, and that first phrase, maybe I would end not on D, but somewhere else so that you kind of leave it hanging as a question in the air. In this case, I didn't go back to D. I kind of asked another question. I extended the question a bit. Okay, that kind of brings us home. But now I've got a phrase, a phrase, and a phrase. I would like to square that up a little bit. So I'll go. That does bring us back to D, and it sort of wraps up that whole little um, basket of phrases. Stuff like that. I don't want to get too down deep into the music theory on it. Just remember to start with your D major scale as a resource for your melody and break them up into phrases that last as long or as short as you want to. You can make them very, very long, like all half notes. Whole notes as well. You can mix them up with quarter notes and eighth notes to give them a bit more energy. As easy, as simple, or as difficult and as complex as you'd like to make it. Experiment with that against the drones. Don't worry about doing any harmony, any chords, or any arrangement. Just kind of play around with some melodies that you can create and write them down based on the fret numbers. If you're not used to creating your own tablature yet, but you know how the song is sort of going, so you don't have to try and keep it all in your head, just remember what frets your fingers are at and then write those numbers down and then you can look back at it instead of having to keep it all in your head. Try that for about a week, and when we come back next time, we will begin to add some harmony, and I'll show you some nice easy ways to come in along behind your melody and drop another string in there to get a beautiful little interval that creates some color as we continue our journey through elements of song. Thank you for joining me once again. I look forward to seeing you next week. Play well, everybody.